take the chili, it's, it's considered to be one of the first plants of globalization because it literally caught like wildfire around the world after it was cultivated in Mesoamerica and, and it just kind of spread and it's really delicious and it's really addictive and there's nothing quite like that like heat that you get from a chili. If you ask folks around the world, they'll have very specific descriptions of like what their chili is and how you use it and how you grow it and what you eat it with. But that plant has traveled thousands of miles to find new homes. The People's Kitchen Collective is an organization based here in Oakland, and we use food to tell stories of our resilience, our shared struggles, and also to build solidarity. We can all have a seat before we get started, and then instead of smelling food, we can start eating food, which is always better. The current series that we're working on is from the farm to the kitchen to the table to the street. So this is a meal series that's been happening over the course of the past year and um, will end this spring. Through this project actually was the first time I ever talked to my own mother about her memories um, of the umeboshi. And for those of you who don't know what umeboshi is, it's a, it's a pickled plum. Um, since ume was never grown throughout California, whenever you see an ume tree, you know that there were Japanese farmers uh, or farmers of Japanese descent that were throughout the West Coast. My mother is Japanese and she was born and raised in Colombia. My grandparents actually left Japan in the 1920s and ended up um, farming there. So they were really adapting, um, you know, to being in a land that, um, that wasn't, you know, where they had been for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. In order for them to be eating like the eggplant and the sesame and um, you know the shiso that they love so much, like when they left, they left with their seeds with them, and that's kind of remarkable to me to think about how a seed is like a time capsule and also just this mark of like cultural survival, like how flavors survive incredible journeys. My father is Indian from West Bengal. So one half of my family is mostly in Colombia and the other half of my family is in a tiny village outside of Calcutta called Krishnagunj. I think I spent the most amount of time in kitchens actually because when I would go visit India, I could I don't really speak Bengali other than like very basic vegetables and fruits and certain things in the kitchen. And so I would one of the ways to spend time with my aunties would be to plop down in the kitchen and just, you know, wedge myself in there until they gave me something to do. And my aunt actually she kind of shooed me away from the kitchen and she was like, you should go study because I didn't study and I'm stuck here for the rest of my life. And I realized like I'm able to see food and like all of its possibility and like all the things I can do with it and all the places it can take me and all the questions I have for it. But for her, it was really never an option, you know, and I think that's so true for so many women. It's not something that you choose to do, it's something that you have to do. And, um, but it was also a way for me to communicate with her and spend time with her. She could show me how to do something and I could, you know, I could try to do it. She would make fun of me, I would do it again. All right, do you want to introduce while we um, start heating this up? I brought uh, chai. I've been making this since I was a little kid. The history of chai is rather complicated. It was actually the British that introduced the consumption of tea on a large scale to South Asia. There was this thing called the Opium Wars because also along with tea, there was opium. And the Chinese basically, they have a lock on the market. And there's a huge dispute around the ports and the borders uh, of these highly valued substances going in and out. But the British realized not only could they grow tea for their own consumption, but they had a billion possible tea drinkers that they were sitting on. So what they did was there was an instituted tea time that was a break, and you're working in a factory for the first time you've left your village, you're coming into these industrialized cities. Well, this is usually has a lot of fat through the milk and a lot of sugar and a, and a jolt of caffeine, and it'll help you push through your day. Three, two, one. Whoa! As a co-founder of the People's Kitchen Collective, um, it's been this incredible, process because it is about the food but it's not about the food. We're interested in like what the flavors of comfort and home are, um, how it is that people have sustained themselves and kept 
each other alive, especially through periods of trauma. And that is what we're interested in cooking. And that to me is also what I'm interested in preserving. Blessings everyone, welcome. We are Sita Kuratomi Bamak. Jocelyn Jackson. And I'm Saki Kamal. The inspiration for this meal is a desire for connections between generations um, and across and between communities as well. And so when we were thinking, wow, 2018, President's Day falls on the same day as the Day of Remembrance for Executive Order 9066. And that was signed by President Roosevelt. So the next course that's coming out is inspired by crafts were made at different camps. Different camps were known for different crafts. And a lot of times inedible seeds were used uh, to make pins. Um, uh, many stories of, of not having flowers when somebody passed away. And so people would make flowers out of paper or out of shells to commemorate the deceased. So it's based on an edible brooch. So we invite you to take this taste. I love food for its baggage, for how much meaning it packs along with it. I think I'm fascinated by this question of like, how far food travels to find home. My grandmother left Japan when she was 18 without really knowing or understanding like where she was going. She got on the ship with my grandfather um, and she actually didn't return to Japan until she was in her 40s after my grandfather had died. One of the things that she missed the most was actually this plum. It's um, ume. It's it's like kind of it's kind of like Japanese aspirin. Like it will cure anything. When she went back to Japan, she was so excited that she ordered a barrel of umeboshi for each family that was living in the Valle del Cauca in um, in Colombia. And I asked my mom, I was like, you know, umeboshi is kind of a it's like a really strong flavor. Like not everybody likes it. Did you like it? And she said, and she was like, you know, I everybody treated it like gold. Like and my mom said that she left Colombia, came back like ten years later and they were still eating out of those barrels. This is actually questions that were asked to people who were leaving the camps. And I'll read out a couple of them. Will you assist in the general resettlement program by staying away from large groups of Japanese? Will you avoid the use of Japanese language except when necessary? Um, in the interviews that we conducted with many of the Nisei um, and Sansei um, folks, Bill Sato shared, you know, just how he, he asked us to imagine the racism before, during, and after the war of what it meant to be Japanese and to walk down the street. And of course he didn't eat Japanese food, because why would you when everyone hates you? The inspiration that I find in the Japanese American community is that there is a recognition that the needle, in fact, has shifted who it identifies as the enemy. I'm so inspired that our elders have taken it upon themselves to share their stories in the interest of building those connections intentionally. So my grandfather was a freedom fighter. In India, he was imprisoned in the Andaman Islands, and one of the punishments was that they would feed, the British would, would mix sand into the rice. It's not a short-term you know, punishment. It's a very long time. It just kind of erodes your digestive system. And so after independence, um, when my grandfather returned home, he had horrible ulcers and a lot of um, you know, gastrointestinal issues. And so nobody in the family ate chili since he was the head of the household. So when I was little, I, to this day, if I'm serving people, I always forget the chili. would not be here at this moment if not for every single one of you remembering things that we have forgotten. Yes. So thank you. I love you. I need you to survive. Welcome everyone. Actually 50 years ago on April 6th, 1968, two days after the shooting of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., little Bobby Hutton was shot at this intersection on 28th Street. So why this day is to remember when there are no monuments here, we 
hold that memory. We eat to hold that memory. We cook to continue that memory. And one of our deepest inspirations is the ability of food to bring radical minds together. And as we're out here on the street, we want it to feel like the living room of West Oakland this afternoon. And as we think about what home and public means, we wanted your first taste inspired by resilience of the indigenous peoples of this land. Food is really just a tool, an excuse for me to make the connections that I think are important to tell the stories that uh, you know, I know uh, need to be told. Culture surviving is as critical to us as getting three meals a day. In a way, a recipe is like a map that also can reveal like how and where people have been and, and how we've gotten to where we are. There's something about tasting a flavor or smelling something that I think registers in the body in a totally different way that really, you know, it's beyond language. It's beyond what you can see. It's beyond what you can read. And, and I think that that is why, honestly, I think so many people are so obsessed with food, right? Because it's just like you can't read your way into that same experience. Mm -hmm.